Hi folks, my name is Arya and today we're going to discuss about ethical hacking using this operating system that has been well known amongst ethical hackers and I think you've guessed it. It's called Kali Linux. Okay, now before we dive right into Kali Linux, let me give you a brief introduction to ethical hacking for those of you who are here on this channel for the first time following the ethical hacking series. So the term hacking has been around for a long time now. The first recorded instance of hacking dates back to the early 1960s in Massachusetts Institute of Technology to the model Railroad Club, where both the terms hacking and hacker were coined. Since then, hacking has evolved into a broadly followed discipline for the computing community. Now, hacking is the process of finding vulnerabilities in a system and using these found vulnerabilities to gain unauthorized access into the system to perform malicious activities ranging from deleting files to stealing sensitive information. Now, hacking is illegal and can lead to extreme consequences if you're caught in the act. People have been sentenced to years of imprisonment because of hacking. Nonetheless, hacking can be legal if done with permission. Now, computer experts are often hired by companies to hack into their systems to find vulnerabilities and weak endpoints so that they can be fixed in the end. Now, this is done as a precautionary measure against legitimate hackers who have malicious intent. Such people who hack into a system with permission without malicious intent are known as ethical hackers and the process is known as ethical hacking. So now that we know what exactly ethical hacking is and who ethical hackers are, let's move over to the hero of our video today and that is Kali Linux. Now Kali Linux is a Debian based Linux distribution aimed at advanced penetration testing and security auditing. Kali contains several hundred tools which are geared towards various information security tasks such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics, and reverse engineering. Kali Linux is developed, funded, and maintained by Offensive Security, a leading information security training company. Now, Kali Linux was released on the 13th of March 2013, has a complete top to bottom rebuild of Backtrack Linux, adhering completely to Debian development standards. Kali Linux is specifically tailored to the needs of penetration testing professionals, and therefore all documentations are actually addressed to them in knowledge of and familiarity with the Linux operating systems in general. Now, as you guys might also know that Kali Linux is basically any Linux distribution that comes preloaded with a bunch of penetration testing software. Now, some might argue that Kali Linux is not really necessary, but well, it does save you a lot of time if you are a penetration tester. Aside from saving a lot of time, there are a number of reasons that you should be using Kali Linux for. Now, let's go over the reasons one by one. First of all, Kali Linux has more than 600 penetration testing tools included. Now, every tool that was included in Backtrack did not actually make it to Kali Linux. A great number of tools are simply not added because they do not work or because they duplicated what other tools did. So now you have a bunch of tools that serve a specific purpose and they are basically not cluttering up your computer with duplicates and useless tools. The second reason that you should be using Kali Linux is because it's free and it always will be. Now Kali Linux like Backtrack is completely free of charge and always will be and you will never have to pay for using Kali Linux. The third reason is an open source kit tree. Now Kali Linux is committed to the open source development model and the development tree is available for all to see. All the source code which goes into Kali Linux is available for anyone who wants to tweak or rebuild packages to suit their specific needs. Then another reason for using Kali Linux is a wide ranging wireless device support. A regular sticking point with Linux distributions has been supported for wireless interfaces. Kali Linux has been built to support as many wireless devices as you can possibly think of allowing it to run properly on a wide variety of hardware and making it compatible with numerous USB and other wireless devices. More adventurous users to customize Kali Linux to their liking all the way down to the kernel, which brings us to the kernel now. And the last reason according to me that you should be using Kali Linux is because custom kernels and patched for injections. So as penetration testers, the development team often needs to do wireless assessment. So our kernel has the latest injection package that allows you to do so with much ease. So this was six reasons as to why you should use Kali Linux. And you can find a lot more reasons on the Kali documentation. So you can go through them if you want. Now, this brings us to the main agenda of our video today. So with that out of the way, now that we know what Kali Linux is and 
how it works and why you should be using Kali Linux. Let's go over the topics that we are actually going to go through the course of this video today. So through the course of this video, you could expect to learn a bunch of stuff. So firstly, we'll go through some command line essentials because Kali Linux tools are mostly in CLI format. So we have to be well versed with the command line essentials. So that's the first thing that we're going to tackle. Then we're also going to tackle how we can stay anonymous using proxy chains in Kali Linux. We'll be talking about Mac changers and we'll be also going into the whole realm of wireless penetration testing. We'll be checking out tools like Aircrack NG and we'll be also testing on how we can brute force some WPS pins. We'll be going through router vulnerabilities and some other miscellaneous topics that I couldn't really group into one. So without wasting much time, let's dive into the first topic for today and that is command line essentials. Now, the way that this video is going to follow is that most of the times we are going to take a hands on approach to learning how to use things in Kali Linux because I'm a firm believer of actually practical work before learning any sort of thing. So we will be using a lot of practical work and I completely encourage you that you go ahead and download and install Kali Linux. You can do it on a virtual machine or you could try and do boot that thing. I'm not meant to teach you how to do that in that video because there are tons of videos out there that teach you how to install Kali Linux. What we are going to do first in this video is that we are going to take a hands on approach to firstly learn what the command line essentials are. Now, as you might have already realized, there are some theoretical aspects that we might need to tackle from time to time. For example, what is a MAC address? What are proxy chains? We'll need to learning some theory. So for the theory, we'll have to go through the obvious evil and that is PowerPoint presentation slides. So I apologize for that from before, but I assure you that most of the time we are going to be looking at a computer screen and I assure you that you will have tons of fun if you just follow along with me. Okay. Another disclaimer that I would like to add before we actually continue with our Kali Linux course, and that is this is not the entirety of Kali Linux. Kali Linux is a huge thing and this is just not it. So these are basically what I find interesting and what you may also find interesting. And these can cause a bunch of damage if you're doing it without permission and damage comes with repercussions, which could include you being arrested. And that is not my fault. Again, I'm saying disclaimer. If you do this without permission, you will get arrested. And that is no way my responsibility because this video is just for educational purposes. OK, now with all that aside, let's move ahead and learn about command line essentials. OK, so now it's time that we go through the command line basics of any Linux terminal. Now the Linux terminal is a very powerful tool. It allows you to move around the whole operating system through the files and folders. It allows you to create files, change their permissions, change how they behave and a bunch of other things. You can do filtering. You can grab stuff, the specific stuff from a specific file. And there's a bunch of interesting things that you can do. And as an ethical hacker, you will be working with a Linux distribution most of the time, whether it may be Kali Linux or some other thing like Parrot OS. But you will be working on Linux most of the time because it's a powerful tool for networking analysis and scanning and all sorts of stuff that you want to do as an ethical hacker. So the first essential step is to actually know how to use the tool that is available to you. And that is out here, which is the terminal. Now, as I'm running this on a virtual machine, you might find it that my execution times are much slower. And that is because I have a very, very slow laptop because my virtual machine is actually eating up a lot of my RAM and I have a bunch of other processes that are also rendering. I do this on my free time. So let's go ahead and go through the commands that we are going to actually go through. Now, let me actually make a list of commands that I want to teach you guys. So let me see if leafpad is available. Firstly, leafpad is basically a text editor. So the first command that we are going to start off with is CD. Now CD stands for change directory. Now at this moment, we are in the root directory. As you guys can see, we can print the current working directory with this thing called PWD. And that is a current working directory. As you see, it's called root. And suppose we want to change our directory to the home directory. So all we have to do is CD, which stands for change directory, as I just said, and specify the path. Now CD slash home. OK, so once we're in home, I want to make a list of commands that are used on the CLI that I want to teach to you guys. So what would I do? I would firstly see if any files are available that I can edit. 
Okay, so these files are available, but let's create a new file for ourselves. So firstly, let's do nano list.txt. Now what nano does is nano will open up a small command line text editor. Now command line text editors are very much used by ethical hackers because they save a bunch of time. If you're always switching between GUI and command line because you'll be doing a bunch of stuff on the command line and suppose you want to write something, you're always switching to GUI. It's a waste of time and you want to save time as an ethical hacker. So you can use this thing called a command line editor and it's, it can basically do most of the stuff a GUI editor would do. Now you say nano and the name of this file. So nano basically has created this file now and it has opened up this new fresh window which overrides the command line that we were in the bash. And this is the place where you can actually edit what goes into the file. Now let's see the list of commands that I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you ls. ls will be the list of files. We did cd. We saw a pwd. So that was the print working directory. We'll be looking at how you can copy stuff with the cp command. Then we'll be looking at mv, which is basically move. Then we'll be looking at cat, and that's an interesting one. And also less, which is another interesting thing. And we'll be looking at grep, which is actually used for grepping or grabbing things from files that you might want to see. You'll see what I mean in a short while. We'll see echo, which probably does what you think if you have any experience with Linux. Then we'll be doing touch and we'll be doing make dir, which is make directory. And then we'll do in ch own, ch mod. Then one of the most dangerous commands has rm. And then you can do man plus help. Okay. So these are the list of commands that we are going to go through in this part of the video. So suppose I was making this video and I wanted to save this somewhere. So if you see down here, there are a bunch of options that are showed to you. Now this carrot sign might be not what you're thinking that the shift six one, it's not shift six. It's actually a control. So carrot is control and then G of course means G. So if you go control G, it will actually get help. Now what we want to do is save the file and that is control O and that is write out. So what we want to do is say control O and now it's going to say if we want to name the file list.txt and we want to name the file and it says that we have written down 15 lines. So that's how you save a file. Now all we want to do is exit out of here. Okay. So first let's go LS and let's go through whatever there is. So LS shows us the list of files that are there in that directory. Now LS can also show you the list of files in a directory with the path that you specify. Like if I say LS var, it'll show me everything that is in var. Okay, there are a lot of interesting things in var. So let's head over to var. So CD slash var and you hit enter. And now we are in the folder var. So now to actually demonstrate how powerful LS is, we have a few flags. Now to see the flags of any command, you can just do dash dash help universally throughout the Unix command line. So out here you see some information that is kind of tough to read, but if you go on top and scroll out here, you'll see all the flags that you can use with the command that is LS and how you can use them. So you can see what to use and you can read a little bit about it. So if you use all, it ignores entries starting with dot. So suppose we were to do ls in var, let's see. So it shows us like this. Now, if we do lsl, it'll show a long list with more information. So these are the permissions that you see out here. We will be seeing how we can change the permissions of files soon enough. And this is who owns the file, the user and the user group. This is the file number, I guess. I'm not sure. This is when they were created. This is the name of the file. This is the time when the file was created, I guess. Okay, so that's how you get very detailed information about all the files. Now, there's another thing you might want to use with ls, and that is the a tag. So you can go lsa, and it will show you all the hidden files also. So now you see some two files that were not shown out here. Our file list begins from backup. But when we do ls slash, I mean hyphen la, we see two more files that is dot and dot dot. So let's see if we can move into that cd dot. So we can't even move into that. So that's interesting. So these are hidden files. So these are not seen to random users and we can actually do stuff with them. We'll see how we can use hidden files later on. So if you want to show hidden files through ls, you all you have to do is ls and hyphen la. 
So that was all about LS. So let's move back to slash home where our list of commands that I want to show you all was. So CD home, let's LS and see what was it called? It's called list. And suppose I want to see the contents of list.txt. All I have to do is say list.txt. Now it shows us whatever this file is containing. It'll read it out for you. So we've done CD, we've done LS and its various forms. We've done PWD. Now it's time to do CP. So CP is basically used for copying files from one place to another. So suppose I want to copy this address file that is there into some other directory, let's say var. So all I would have to do is cp name.txt and then you specify which location you want to actually copy it to. So cd slash var. So this is where I want to copy my file to and you hit enter and it's copied. But that was a very small file. Now we can actually check if it was copied before I move on and pour some more knowledge into you. So let's go into var, so cd slash var, hit enter, and you're in var again, and you see ls, and now you see a name.txt. So let's remove name.txt from here, because I want to copy it again and show you all a difference between a flag that I'm going to use right now. So the hyphen and letters that you use are called flags technically in the Linux terminology. So let's go back to home. Now, instead of the name of the file and moving back to home, just like I did, you can type out the complete name of the file out here. So you could have gone cd slash home slash name.txt and copy to slash var. But this time, what we're going to do is we're going to use the hyphen v, which is basically used for a verbose output of whatever you're doing. So most of the commands that we're going to using will have a hyphen v with them. So let's see how this actually affects the output. So what we're going to do is we want to copy. So P and verbose and we want to copy the file name.txt and we want to copy it to the folder called var, right? So now you'll see that it will give us what is being moved rather that is name.txt and where it is being moved to. So this is a very good way of knowing what is actually happening because if you do it without the verbose part and suppose name.txt was just a 20 GB file and you just don't know if it has finished or not. So if it's a 20 GB file, it'll continuously update you on where what is being copied. So basically all you have to do is type hyphen V if you want to know where your file is being copied and the exact path. Okay, so that was about how you can copy files from here and there. Now, what was the next command that we want to see? So cat. So let me just go and see the next command that is there. So list.txt. So after cat, I want to show less. Okay, so we've done CP. We also have to do MV. Now, as you guys can see that CP is basically a copy. Copy is as you would expect. It leaves a copy of the file that in the original directory while also maintaining a copy in the directory that you specified. But if you want to move the file completely, all you would have to do is use the command MV. So MV is for moving the file. Now let's see what all goes with MV. So you can type help and as I said, you get the verbose option and you get suffixes. You can force things to happen. So suppose you don't have the permission, do not prompt before overwriting. So it'll give you a prompt and you can completely overlook the prompt with the F thing. So let me just show you how that looks like. We'll be doing a verbose and we will be copying the address .txt file. And okay, so every time I've been actually typing, so you can do address.txt by just pressing tab and it'll autocomplete. So address.txt to slash var. Now it'll show you that it is actually renamed address.txt to var address.txt. Now, if you go and do ls out here, you will see that address.txt is not actually here, but if we were to move to var, so cd slash var. Okay, I've also been typing out commands that I've been previously using, and you can simply toggle through all the commands that you've used by the up and down keys. So ls, mv, mvv help, cat list. I did cd home, and now I have to go through all this just to prove a point. So cd var, we want to change there. Now we're in the variable folder and we also want to see what we have out here. So address should be out here and ls and as you guys can see address.txt is the first file that has come up and it is basically the same file and I can prove that to you by just catting the file and address.txt and you see that is some random address for some random person. Okay, now let's quickly clear out our file. 
our window. You can do that with the control L or you can just type out clear. Now, what we want to do is move back to home. So yes, yeah, CD home. Okay, so now that we're back in home again, let's cat out our next file. So list.txt and after move, I want to go through cat. Now cat, as you guys can see, is printing out the contents of a file and there's also less, which does something very similar to cat. So let's see what it does. So if you go less and do list.txt, you actually see the contents of the file in a completely new window, which overlays on the previous window. And this is a very neat way to actually see the contents of a file, which is through less. If you want to keep your main command line interface not so cluttered, which cat clutters it completely. So if you want to get out of this place, this less place, and all you have to do is press Q and Q gets you back. And as you see, nothing was printed out on our main interface. So this is a very cool way to actually keep your command line interface neat and tidy when you're doing work. Okay, so grep. So grep is used for actually filtering out stuff from a file. So suppose we want to see whether a command has some verbose option to it or not. So now I know that MV has a verbose command, but suppose I didn't know that. So MV dash dash help then you use the pipe sign. So what the pipe sign means is you have to take this command, the first command, and then you pipeline it through the second command. And you want to see grep hyphen V if that exists. Okay, so let's see grep verbose. Yep, so a verbose exists and that is hyphen V and that's hyphen hyphen verbose. So explaining what is being done. So what happened out here is basically we took this first command and then we filter it and filtering is done through the piping. So basically think about you're taking some information and pipelining it through something else which funnels it out of this command, which is grep. So you can use mv slash help in conjunction with a bunch of other commands, just not grep. And I'll leave the creativity up to you. So grep is basically used for getting what you want from a file. And grep is used very, very much throughout this course of this video, through this Kali Linux tutorial that you're going to be watching. So that is a very easy way to see if you have a particular option or let me do something else also. So CD slash var. Now we're in the var folder and let's ls. We actually have name.txt. Now let's also go into backup. So CD B and tab and that brings us to backup folder and we're now in the backup folder. Let's do an ls out here. Okay, so we have a bunch of files. Okay, we have some password dot back. Now, see, if you have cat and you go password dot back, you can see the entire thing. Now, what if you didn't want this entirety of it? Or if you want something in particular, you want to be very neat. So you can do that same command. You can pipeline it and you can say grep and you want everything with no login. So we can see that there are a bunch of things that say no login and we only want those. And these are all the things that say no login in them. And it's a much lesser list and it gives us a very particular list that you are looking for. So that is how you use grep. So now let's head back to home. Uh, okay, I typed that wrong. And again, let's see what the next command is. So now let's start the XT. So we've done grep. We now have to do echo. Echo and then touch. Okay, let's go back. Q. So we press Q and we get out of there. So what did I have to teach again? I'm such a dummy. We have to do echo. Okay, so what is echo used for? So suppose you were to say echo and open code, hello world. It would basically do what command says, and that is echo whatever you say. Now it'll say echo hello world, and that will basically echo whatever you typed out in the quotations that is hello world, spelled very wrong. Okay, now suppose you want to actually put this into a file. So you could do echo hello world. Let's spell it properly this time. And you want to insert into a file. We had a phone number, I guess, phone number.txt. Yep. And we can echo it into that thing. Now that was done. Now let's see what is phone number.txt. Phone number.txt. And it says hello world. So you can basically input text into a certain file with the echo command. And that's how you do it. Okay. Now let's also see how you can make directories. And that is with the make directory command. So, okay, we also have to do touch before that, I forgot. Now touch is used for quickly creating files. So touch, you could say touch and then the file name. So we can create a name file again, name.txt. 
or that will create a name.txt. Let me just show it to you LSL and we have a name.txt. We can also create multiple files with touch and you could say file one, file two and file three. So like this, you can create multiple files and let me just LS that out and show it to you LSL and we have file one, file two and file three. Now we can also create a directory. So make DIR and the name of the directory. So suppose you wanted to save all your movies in one directory, so you make directory movie. And now you have a directory called movies and you can also move into movies. So CD movie. OK, so that's how you create directories and you can move into them with the change directory folder. Now let's see what the next command was. So CD and dot dot. So if it's CD dot dot, you can move back to the previous folder if I've already not told you that. And since we're in movies, we can just go back to home with CD dot dot after. Now let's see what else is there. So cat list dot txt. And OK, now ch own ch mod. Now ch own will be a little tough to show because we don't have any sort of other user out here. The root user is the only user that we have on this virtual box that is set up. But if you want to change the ownership of a file, so let's say, so you can see the ownership of a file through the LSL command and you see that root and root. So this is the owner name and this is the owner group and they're mostly the same thing. So our next command that we're going to actually see is called ch own. So let's see how ch own is actually used. ch own is used for changing the ownership of a file. So I actually don't remember how to use ch own. So if you actually don't remember or you're getting stuck somewhere, just use the help function. So if a command line argument is symbolic, so let me just go through this once. So this is how you use it, owner and then colon group. Okay, and then the file name. So you go ch own and then you want to say the name of the owner and the group you want it to belong to that is root and root. And then you specify the name of the file. So suppose I want to change file one. Now it already belongs to root and root, so it doesn't really matter because I don't have any other username to actually change the ownership to. So this is how you would normally change ownership. So let me just show you where you can see the ownership and that is ls hyphen L and out here the root and root you see on file one is basically this is the owner and this is the owner group. They're normally the same thing and the same name, but if you had some different owner like a guest, you could change it by actually using the ch own method or the command. Methods are different things. I always get confused because of the programming. OK, now the next command that is left is called chmod. To actually show you how chmod works, let me show you an interesting file. So suppose, let me just do this once. OK, now echo. What we want to echo is, let's echo hello world. And uh, let's put that in quotation and we want to put this in test. Now, once we've done that, let's ls and we see that we have a test file out here. And we want to move test to test.sh. So test.sh is the executable file that is used in bash scripting. So we move test to test.sh and the way you actually execute bash files on your command line is with the dot and the slash. So you say dot slash and if I press T and I press tab, you see that there is no options that's coming up. That is because test.sh is not an executable file. So test.sh is don't have the executable permission. So let me just show that to you. LS and you see test.sh, it doesn't have the executable. Now you see movie, it is executable. I don't know why it is a directory. So it is an executable. You can move into it. So it's blue in color. So the way you actually can make this an executable is by changing its permissions. So the way you do that is chmod and basically you change it to an executable. So plus X. Uh, that is making an executable. If you do plus R, it'll make it readable. And if you do plus W, it'll make it writable also. So if you do plus X and do test.sh, and now you go and do LSL, you'll see that test.sh has become green because it is an executable file now. And now if you do dot slash and you press T, you get test.sh if I press tab. So now it is an executable file. And if I execute it, it presses out hello world under my screen. So that's how you can use the ch mod or which is basically the change of permissions of files. And we'll be changing permissions of files throughout the course of this video. It'll be very useful for us. And you'll see as we go along with this video. OK, so the next thing that I want to show you all only two are left and I remember those now and it is RM. 
And RM is used for actually removing files. So you should be very careful while using RM or any sort of removing command on a Linux system because once you remove something, it is very difficult to get it back and it's almost near impossible. It's not like Windows where it's basically just disappeared in front of your eyes, but it's still there in the memory cluttering it all up. That's why Linux always trumps Windows. That's one of the reasons. I'll make a video on that later on. But for now, let's focus on RM. Now we can remove file one. So let's see. So file one is going to be removed. So if we ls now, you see file one doesn't exist. But let me show you RM. And if I do movie, it'll say cannot remove movie is a directory. But if you go into the help menu, I bet there will be a option that you can just forcefully remove it. So RM force will just remove. So RM slash R and you can do movie and it'll recursively remove everything. And if you go here and do LSL, you'll see that there is no movie directory anymore. And that is how you can remove movies. Now that prompt that you see out there is actually a safety measure because once you remove a directory and it's not retrievable, that's a very sad scenario. And you don't want to get yourself in such a scenario in whatsoever possibility. Okay, moving on, so on, so forth. That was all about the RM folder. Now you can do RM and the address of anything. So RM, I know we moved an address.txt. So into the var folder, we can go RM var and address.txt. And that will remove address.txt from the folder of var. Let me just show you that worked. So cd var and ls, and you see that there is no address.txt out here. Okay, another way to get help for any command that you want is man. And suppose you want to see about rm. It'll show everything about rm that is there to show to you. It'll show you how to use it. It'll give you a description, synopsis, the name, remove files or directories. It's a very useful way. So out here you see this is a manual page. So that is where it means man and you can press line one or edge or you can press Q to quit. So that's very much helpful. Okay guys, so that was all about the command line interface and how we can use it to go about the operating system and change file permissions, copy files, move files and a bunch of other stuff. Now it's time to get on with the interesting stuff and that is firstly, we're going to be learning how you can actually stay anonymous with proxy chains. Okay, guys, so now that we are done with the command line basics, it's time that we move forward with proxy chains. So before we move forward with proxy chains, let us head back to our PowerPoint presentation and see what exactly proxy chains are. Okay, so proxy chains. Now, as the name suggests, proxy chains are basically a chain of proxies. Now, where is a proxy used? A proxy is used whenever you want to anonymize yourself on the wire or the network. You do not want to know or you do not want your others to know what the source IP address was for your client system. And to do this, all you have to do is send your packets through a bunch of intermediary systems. And these intermediary systems carry the packet out and they transmit it to the target system. And this is much slower. And let's see how we can use this in Kali Linux now in combination with Tor to in order to anonymize traffic, not only on web browsing traffic, but rather instead on all networks related traffic generated by pretty much all your applications. But you can also change this in the settings. Now what we're going to do is we're going to open up the proxy chain configuration file and we're going to understand all its options that are available. So to do that, all you have to do is say nano. You go into the etc folder and then you go for the proxy chain dot conf and what you see out here is the nano editor and we had spoken about the nano editor when we were discussing the cli part i hope you haven't skipped that now what you see out here is a bunch of instructions and options so let me just zoom in into this command line interface and now you can read everything much well so what proxy chains is well it gives you the ability rather to route your traffic through a series of proxy servers and stay anonymous in such a fashion by hiding behind them or by having them forward your requests so it looks that on the other side that your requests are coming from them as opposed to you now surprisingly enough there are a large amount of these proxy servers out there that you can use but they're not very stable you know they go up and down and they're not very fast so for specific targets they can be useful but not for brute forcing and not for any sort of computing attack. So suppose you're doing something to a certain target. If you're trying to log in or you're already logged in, you can definitely do it through proxy chains. 
and it will be reasonably fast and reasonably stable as well but if you're doing some sort of mass scanning or you're brute forcing a password or something of a kind of a proxy chain with a list of proxies selected from the internet especially the free proxies it's not going to work i mean it's going to work out eventually in a technical sense but it will consume more time than you can spare and by that i mean it can be very very long time it can take about months or two to do a simple scan so that's not an option and there are other ways of doing that but for the time being i just want you to know how you can use proxy chains and how you can configure it and actually because it's really useful and i use it fairly often and a lot of people do and it's a fantastic piece of software so first off we have the types of proxies so you see HTTP, SOX4, and SOX5. Now, there are fundamental differences between these protocols, and you always want to find yourself a SOX5 proxy as that's the best possible one, and that has the ability to anonymize all sorts of traffic. HTTP, well, as the name it says, it's for HTTP traffic, and SOX4 is very similar to SOX5, but it does not support IPv6 protocol, and it does not support UDP protocol. So this can be SOX4, and it can be rather problematic, and you always want to make sure that you're using SOX5, wherever and however. Anyway, down below, you have these other options, which we will go over. So basically, how you enable these options is that you don't need to type some complex lines of code or anything of any kind. Basically, all you have to do is just delete the hash out here. Let me just show you. So suppose we wanted to actually activate dynamic chains options. So all we have to do is delete the hash. But let's put in the hash right now. So after you delete the hash, all you have to do is save the file and the option is enabled. This hash presents a commented outline, meaning that the system reading this will ignore if there is a hash and if there isn't a hash, it will take it into consideration and interpret it accordingly. Anyway, what we have here are statements which allow us to specify how we want our traffic to be routed. So first off, we have dynamic chain. A dynamic chain is a sum and is an option which you will find people using the most. It is most commonly used option and a preferable one too at that. And honestly, I think it's the best one out there primarily because it's the most stable one. And here's why. Now suppose you have ABCD proxies. So those are some servers with IP addresses, with open ports. And if you have a strict chain policy, which is enabled on this computer right now, as you see, if you have a strict change policy, we can only be able to access any site on the internet in general by going through ABCD. So you have to go through all of them and you have to go through them in that specific order that is ABCD. And that's not always a good thing. I mean, if you're paying for five proxies, that's not a problem because they will always be operational and they will always be up. And why not? That's not a bad idea or an option. But there are, however, people who use proxies for free and they don't tend to pay for them. Why would you pay for like five proxies for a simple scan or something of that kind? They're not free and they cost money and they're rather expensive also. But still, I mean, the act of paying itself identifies you and kind of diminishes the amount of anonymity you have on the Internet. So some complex payment methods can still be used to actually anonymize yourself, but it's fairly simpler to just use a dynamic chain. So firstly, we're going to go ahead and uncomment the dynamic chain option and we're going to comment out the strict chain option. So strict chain will no longer be used and I will be using dynamic chains. And one more thing to note here is that if you want to use proxy chains in combination with Tor, if you want to route all your traffic through the Tor network, not just web traffic, you must be enabling dynamic chains. I mean, there is a chance that it will work with strict chains, but due to the instant instability of Tor nodes, it is highly unlikely you will need dynamic chains. And that is why I'm using them. Anyway, if you are using dynamic chains, just give you the ability to go from ABCD to your desired destination by not having to adhere to any order. So let's say C is down and you would go a B, D and it would work with no problems. Even if B was down, you would go to a D and you would go and still reach the destination. So as long as one single proxy is functional, it's going to work and you don't require any specific order to do it down below. Now down below you have some other options too. So first is random chains. Now random chains in effect are basically the same thing as resetting your service. I mean, if you're resetting your Tor, you will be now assigned new IP address. In Tor assigns your new IP address every 10 minutes or so. Anyway, with the random chain, you can specify a list of IPs and then you can tell your computer, okay, I want you to try and I want you to connect to this point. And every time you connect, every time you transmit a packet, I want you to use a different proxy and we can do that as well. And that's one of the options, definitely. And you can say, okay, use this is phone five times and then change to another one or some kind of like that. There are a lot of options to specify there, primarily the chain length. Anyway, down below there's quiet mode. 
uh, you don't really need that. Then that's proxy DNS request no leak from DNS data. This is very important. You cannot have any DNS leak. And let me explain to you what DNS leaks are. And even though somebody cannot get your particular IP address, they can get the IP address of the DNS server that you are using. And that DNS servers do is resolve the main domain to the IP address and vice versa. So for example, if you typed in youtube.com, the DNS server of your local ISP provider will resolve that into some sort of IP address that YouTube has and it will make a request. No problem. And you do not want that happening because your local DNS server will be discovered and that is information that can be used in order to figure out your personal IP address. And when that is done, your physical location is pretty much compromised and that's a no-go and you definitely need proxy DNS here. It might slow you down a bit, but without that, you're practically not anonymous and it's just a matter of time before somebody finds you. Now, if you go down below, we have some other options here, but we're not really interested in them at the moment. What we hear are for the formats for entering proxies and I'm going to leave it at that. So what you see out here is first the type of the proxy that is SOX5, then the IP address, then the port number, and then two words that is Lama secret and then juice to hidden. Okay, so now what you see out here, as I just said, is how you would actually write down your proxy chains. And now, as I had already also said, you always want to be using SOX5 and you don't want to be using HTTP because they're not really that safe. And SOX5 doesn't support a lot of options anyway. And this is the IP address of the proxy server that we will enter a few of them manually later on. And this here is the port number that you see on which the proxy server is listening. And that port is open over here. These two words now, what some proxy servers, especially paid ones, will always have a username and password. So you can just type them here in plain text. Unfortunately, it is assumed that only you and you alone have access to this computer besides this file. And besides this file is you, not, not everybody can read this file. Anyway, so if you can just type in the username here and password here, you will gain access to a certain proxy that you have chosen or that you have paid for. Anyway, these are just some examples and we won't actually be using these proxies or anything of a kind. We need to go down below here, out here you see, and at the end of the file, so if I just press enter a couple of times, there we go. So here is only one proxy active at the moment and it's in SOX4 and all traffic being routed here through Tor by default. So let's set to Tor now and Tor default listens on this port. So this uh, 905 report is where Tor listens on. Now, what we want to do is we want to add a SOX5 proxy address. So what you want to do is just type in SOX5 and the same IP address, SOX5. And you want to be keeping the space incorrect, just use tab. So 127.0.0.1. And then you want to specify the port number also, so 9050. So what you see out here, the 127.0.0.1, this is the loopback address of your computer. So this is for into device communication and if you ping this address and if you're pinging yourself basically and usually people ping this address in order to make sure that the IP port protocol is set up correctly even though they don't have internet connectivity so let's just type in 1.27.0.0.1 and the same port number and 9050 so now we have to press Control o to save our file and we're going to save under the same name and we wrote 65 lines of codes down and that's written and now you have to press Control X and you exit out. So let's press Control L and clear out our screen. Now we just edited our proxy chains configuration in a very neat environment. So to go ahead and type in our service door status. So we want to check status of our Tor service. So service Tor status. So Tor service could not be found. So do we have the Tor service installed? Okay, so Tor service is not installed. Just give me a little moment. I'll quickly install it. Okay, so now that we have set up our proxy chains configuration file and we have put in a SOC5 proxy chain giving it the Tor service. Now what we need to do first is start up our Tor service. Now to actually check if Tor is running or not or if the Tor service is running or not, let me just clear that out. We need to go service Tor status. And you see it says it's inactive. So what you have to do is say service Tor start and that will start the Tor service. It might take some time depending on the system that you're using and voila that it has started it for me. Now what you have to do to actually use proxy chains before you go to any website. So all you have to do is say proxy chains 
Then you specify the browser that you're using. So we're going to be using Firefox. And you could say something like www.duckduck.com. So now here you will see how your thing is being transmitted to duckduckgo.com. When I say thing, I mean your packets and your requests. I'm sorry for my vocabulary. So now your packets are going to be directed through a bunch of IP addresses, but we haven't actually put a bunch. We just have put the loop back for the Tor network. So we will let Tor do the rest of the things for us. Okay, so depending on your system, this might take a little bit of time to actually open up. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what's actually happening on the terminal while this thing is loading up. Okay, as you can see, it's going through a bunch of proxies out here and some are denying it and some are saying it's okay. So as you guys can see, most of the time you might get denied and it'll be a lesser number of okays and that is exactly what we're looking for. Because primarily we have gone a great extent for the anonymity and what you want to do is stay like that. So this is basically how you use proxy chains. Now, if this computer just decides to open up TalkTalkGo.com on Mozilla, I could actually show you some interesting stuff, but it seems my computer has kind of given up on actually opening DuckDuckGo. It's still waiting for DuckDuckGo's actually confirmation, but that's about it. So this is how you can actually configure proxy chains. I'm really sorry that my computer isn't working right now so well and nothing is actually opening on Mozilla. It's mostly because my RAM is overloaded. I think I should go ahead and get myself a new RAM. But for now, let me just also say that we can put some custom proxy lists and instead of just saying, let me just go ahead and open up that file again. As you guys can see out here, I'm going to end this right now because my computer can't really take all this pressure. See, it's lagging so hard. Okay, let me just quit out of that and let me just open up a new one. Now, as I had said that you can put up some custom proxy lists. Not really gonna do that, but let me just show you how you can do that. You go nano and you go etc. and proxy. So you basically have to go into the proxy chain. Okay, so I think I have to put this again. Yeah, now if you just go in and edit out here, all you have to do is set up dynamic chains and you can go online and search for free proxy lists and that'll give you everything with the port number to the IP address. Let me just show it to you. Free proxy server list. So all you have to do is search for free proxy server list and you can see out here the proxy type is HTTPS and you basically want to find a SOC5 proxy. To find SOC5 proxies, just add that into your keyword. And once you find those proxy addresses, all you have to do is take down this IP address and followed by the port number. And you go ahead and just put it down in this configuration file. And then you hit Control O and you just save it and then you just go back. So that was all about proxy chains and how you can set up proxy chains to set, make yourself very anonymous. I'm sorry, the whole Mozilla part didn't work. That's your sad state of my computer. But moving on, let's go ahead and study about Mac changes. Okay guys, so that was all about proxy chains. Let's move ahead to Mac changer. Okay, now before we go into the tool called Mac changer, let's just see what a Mac address is. Now Mac address actually stands for media access controller address of a device and is a unique identifier assigned to a network interface controller for communication purposes. Now Mac addresses are used as a network address for most IEEE A02 network technologies, including ethernet, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. Now in this context, MAC addresses are used in the medium access control protocol sublayer and as typically represented as MAC addresses are not recognizable as six groups of two hexadecimal digits each. Now these are separated by a colon and the first three hexadecimals are actually the organizationally unique identifier. So they actually represent your vendor and the next three hexadecimals actually represent your network card uniquely. Okay, so when you are actually on a network, you are recognized on something called an ARP table. Let me just show you the ARP table, how you can see it. Let's go in. So the password is root. So an ARP table is basically an address resolution protocol table. And well, this is a virtual machine and it doesn't really know many machines on the local network. But if I were to go on my Windows system and show you my ARP table, let's see. Okay, so if I show you the ARP table of my Windows machine or any machine that has a TCP IP protocol suite installed, you will have this command that is working called ARP and you give the hyphen A and now you see that your IP address or somebody else's IP address is actually mapped to a physical address. Now the MAC address is very commonly used in the ARP protocol 
And this is how you are actually identified on a network. Now, sometimes what you want to do is be unknown on this network. There are various reasons why you want to do that. Let me just give you an example of a very malicious reason that was done in my college. So we as students would actually change the MAC address of our own computer to the professor's computer. So we would somehow look up the professor's IP address and then come to know about his MAC address. And then we would spoof our MAC to be his MAC address. And then we would do some type sort of malicious activity on the college internet. And then the internet administrators of our college would come to know that that MAC address is doing some sort of malicious activity. And that MAC address would get permanently banned for that session on the college network. So basically, our professor would not be able to use the wireless projectors that he would use to actually show us his presentations. And we end up getting a free class. Now, I am not actually promoting any sort of bad activity like this. I have just experienced this in my own college life. So that was something. But there are many other reasons that you might want to spoof your Mac. Now, Mac Changer is an amazing tool for actually spoofing your Mac. So first of all, how do you come to know your Mac address? So let's see you go IF config and this will give us our Mac address. Now this address that you see out here is the Mac address of this machine. So you can also check out the Mac address by going Mac changer. Then let's type in the help options and this will show us how to get the Mac address. So if you see there's a show flag so we can go Mac changer. And you can put the S and then you put the interface. Now the interface is where it's working. So at zero is where we are actually getting. We don't want the loopback one. So at zero and this will give us the MAC address. So our current MAC address is 080027. Let's see if that was the same one shown. Where is that MAC address? Okay, so ether 080027. So I'm sorry, this was the MAC address. I selected the wrong thing. What I was showing you is the IPv6 address and you can see that's very, very long. So this is our MAC address. Now what you might want to do to change your MAC address? Well, let's see. With V, we can get the version. With S, you can show. We can do the E. And as I said, if you remember that the first three bits is about the vendors, so you can also get the vendor list by going hyphen L. So you go hyphen L, and this will give you a list of uh, MAC addresses and which vendor they belong to. So sometimes if you know the vendors that are actually being used on the network of your college, for example, and you want to just stay anonymous and not raise any flags of suspicion. So you could hide yourself as a Cisco router. So suppose your college was using all sorts of Cisco routers and you decided that today I'm going to spoof myself as a Cisco router and I'm going to screw around with the network. So it would not raise any flags before you actually decided to do some malicious activity. In some deeper inspection of your MAC address, people would actually realize that you are actually spoofing the address. And after some investigation, they would indeed take some time to actually reach to you and how you spoofed it. But the point of changing your Mac is not raising any flags. And that is exactly what you should try to do. So Mac changer is also very useful for getting the list of all the Mac addresses and their vendor IDs. Now, let me just clear the screen out quickly. So we go clear and let's bring back the help. So we go Mac changer and dash dash help. Now, what we want to do is give ourselves a random MAC address. Now, MAC changer. So that is done with the R flag, and we want to do it on ETH0. So once you run that, you will be given a new MAC address. So our new MAC address is F6C649. Now, you can verify that by running ifconfig. Now, we could just do ifconfig, and you see our new MAC address is on Ether. So we could also do something like this ifconfig. And you could grab Ether. So that is just telling you the MAC address, and this is completely new. Also, you could show it through the MAC changer tool itself. Okay, so we need to give it the E0. I forgot that. Now you see that this is our current MAC address, and this is our permanent MAC address, and they two are completely different. Sometimes you also might want to actually change your MAC when your laptop is or your system is booting up because. You might want to stay anonymous all the time. Who knows? And sometimes you might think I'll actually change it when I want to change it. But let's face it. We are forgetful as human beings and we tend to forget things that we are supposed to do. So what else is better than to actually automate the whole process yourself and forget about remembering all these stupid nitty gritty stuff. So you can tell Linux or Kali Linux to actually change your Mac address on boot up is use this tool called Crontab.
Now, crontab is actually used for scheduling tasks on Linux. So let me show you how to do that. Firstly, let's clear our screen and go crontab and go help. Now you see it's a pretty small menu. So first we start with the U flag, which user this file is going to work for. Then we got the E flag, which is for editing crontab users, the users crontab list. And you can see the list of users crontab. And let's see. So do we have any crontab list? So there is no crontab at this moment. So we can set up one for ourselves by going to the E. Then there's the R, which is delete users crontab. And I want to tell you all, be very careful when deleting anything of that sort, because once you delete something from Linux, as I've already said, that it is very, very difficult to actually retrieve it back. You might get fragmented pieces of what you had actually deleted, and that will only leave you with sadness and devastation. Now, what you want to do is go through crontab and press E, and this will bring us to select an editor to change later run select editor. So we'll do it with nano. So what you have out here is the readme file of crontab. And if you read this entire thing, you will get how to use crontab completely. But if you have any sort of doubts, even after reading it, you can leave them down in the comment section below. Now, what you want to do is actually set up a crontab so that you can change your MAC address whenever you reboot your computer. So all you have to do is say at reboot, what you want it to run is Mac changer. And if you remember, we want a random Mac address and we want it on each zero. So that's done. Now all you have to do is save this thing. So you go control O and that will write it out to cron tab and you press enter and you have written down one line. Now you go control X and you have exited out. So now let's us clear the screens by pressing control L and enter and let's go ahead and get our Mac address. So if we go ahead and run that, our MAC address is set to F6, C6, 49. So just remember the first few letters, F6, C6, and 49. Uh, now let me just reboot my computer, and you will see after I reboot and run ifconfig again with grep ethop, we will see a different MAC address. Now rebooting might take some time because I'm actually using a virtual machine, but still now it's given problems with the Firefox, but let's hope this won't take much time. Okay, so now that our computer has booted up and we have actually opened up our terminal, let's go in and type ifconfig and let's get in our ether that is the MAC address. So if you remember the MAC address, now you see that it has completely changed and that's how you can spoof your MAC address on your local network. And this will basically help you in staying anonymous on our protocols and anything that actually maps your IP address to the MAC address. Okay, so that was all about MAC changers. I'll meet you in the next section now. So in this section, we'll be talking about a uh, wireless encryption protocol cracking. So that is basically Wi-Fi cracking. Now, Wi-Fi in today's day and age uses pins or passwords to normally encrypt their data usage. Basically, if you want to access the wireless access point, you need a password or a pin to actually gain authorization. Now, this authorization is done using a four-way handshake which we will try to capture using a tool called Aircrack NG. And then we will try to crack into the password using a wordless generator called Crunch. Now you can use Aircrack NG to crack WPA and WPA2. There's also another protocol called WEP or WEP, and that is not normally used these days. If you find anybody using that, you should always advise them to actually upgrade to WPA or WPA2 because WEP is actually very easily cracked in these days and people are generally punished for using WEP by hackers all around the world. Okay, so now you can actually go ahead and go into a terminal and type ifconfig to actually look at your network card name. As you guys can see out here, it's called WLO1. So the first step that we need to do to actually go into the process of Wi-Fi cracking is set up our network access card or our access point into monitor mode. So as you guys can see out here after typing ifconfig, it shows me that my Wi-Fi access card is WL01 interface. Now our process of cracking passwords is pretty simple. What we want to do is actually monitor for all sorts of access points that are nearby to us. Once we have chosen the access point that we want to actually penetrate into and find the password, what we want to do is run an arrow dump scan on it, and then we will try and deauthenticate any device that is connected to that access point. Now, one assumption out here is that the password is saved in that device and it will automatically try to re-authenticate itself with the access point. And we want to catch and log this re-authentication process, which will 
actually have a four-way handshake between your device and the access point. So this is basically the procedure we are going to follow. Now, another thing that you need to know before actually using this process to gain any access to any Wi-Fi is that you need to know a little bit about what the password is. Maybe it could be the length or it could be something like a specific character at a specific place. Maybe you know a series of characters. So you just can't really guess the password out of thin air. That is not how cracking works unless you have some unlimited potential of processing power. In that case, you can very well brute force it and just find the password. But if you are not somebody who has unlimited processing power and you're trying to use Aircrack NG, you need to know a little bit about the password. Also, before we proceed with this wireless encryption protocol cracking, what I want to say is if you want to get into somebody's Wi-Fi network or you want to actually test for vulnerabilities it's better that you test for router vulnerabilities than actually cracking a wi-fi password because you're more likely than not to find more router vulnerabilities than actually successfully crack a wi-fi password if you don't know anything about it if you don't know anything about the password just go ahead and run some vulnerability tests on the router itself and more often than not you will just find something you can abuse Okay, now let's talk about the two tools that I'm going to be using. Now these two tools, one of them is already installed on Kali Linux, but if you are not using this on Kali, you can also use this on any Linux based system. So what you have to do is download and install Aircrack NG, which is easily installed with the command apt-get install Aircrack NG. And you also have to install this word list generator called crunch. Now crunch is easily downloadable by just Googling the name and the first link will be a source forge link and all you have to do is go inside that and install it. And once you figured out how to install crunch, you can make sure that it's installed. Now, once you have installed both the softwares, you can check out if the manual pages are opening up. Let me just open the manual page of Aircrack NG and show you that it has been properly installed. Now, as you guys can see, the manual page of Aircrack NG opened up and the manual page of Crunch is also opening up. So that means both of our softwares have been successfully installed on our system. Now, before we go ahead, let me just show you how crunch actually works. So crunch is basically a word list generator. What you would do is you try and generate a word list with given characters. So what you can see out here is I've typed in crunch three five. So that means the minimum length is three and the maximum length is five. And I've given it a series of numbers. So it will use these numbers and generate all the words that are possible from length three to length five. So the way we are going to use crunch in conjunction with Aircrack is that we are going to use crunch to generate the word list and then we are going to pipe the word list through Aircrack NG when we are actually trying to capture and crack what we will capture in a certain log file. Now what you want to do first is actually put your network interface card on a monitor mode. Now you can do that by typing in ifconfig and then the interface name which happens to be WL01 and first you have to put it down. So ifconfig WL01 down. Now to put your interface card into monitor mode, you have to type in iwconfig and you go the name of the interface and then you go mode monitor. Okay, it seems I've spelled it wrong. So let me just do it once again. So that has put our network interface card into monitor mode. And what we need to do after that is we need to start up our network interface. So all we have to do is type in ifconfig wl1 up. Now, once it is up and running, you can check by typing in ifconfig that indeed your network interface card is up and running. Don't worry, it's running in monitor mode if it's up and running. What we want to do next is pretty important to the whole process. So what we want to do now is check for some services that might still be running in the background that might hamper with our whole scanning process. So we do this by actually typing in the command airmon ng check and then the name of the interface. So as you guys can see, nothing is exactly running right now, but if there were any process running, you would only add the command airmon ng check and instead of writing the interface name, all you have to do is say kill. 
and it will kill any processes. Now, if you see any process named the network administrator, you want to kill that process first separately and then kill any other child processes. You may need to actually run this command a few times before all the processes are killed and then you're good to go. Okay, so now that we have finished killing all the sub processes, what we want to do is run an error dump scan on the network card. So that is WL01. So for this, we go error dump hyphen ng and then we put in the name of the interface. And this will start up a scan that will look something like this. So after you run the error dump scan on your interface, what you see out here is a result of all the access point that is found out through the monitoring mode. Now, if you see, we have a bunch of columns out here. First of all, we have the BSS ID column. Now the BSS ID column is basically the MAC address of all the routers that are found. Now every router obviously has a MAC address. So those are the MAC address that is tied to the router names, which is shown by the ESS ID. Then we have the PWR column, we have the beacons column, we have the data packets column. Another important column is the channel column. It's important to know which channel your router is working on. Then we can see the cipher column, the authentication. So out here we can see the encryption that is used. So most of it is using WPA2. So what we will be cracking is basically WPA2. So from this list, what you need to recognize is basically the Wi-Fi router that you want to crack into. Now I'm performing this particular test in my office and I don't really have the permission to actually go in and test them for these vulnerabilities. I'm not the security analyst of here. So I don't really have the permissions to penetrate into them. So what I have done is I have run a similar test at home using my own Wi-Fi and I will show you the results for that. But for this working example, you will see the scans that I'm running in this office. So as we intend to stay ethical, what we are going to do out here is we are going to capture whatever we find in our office for only educational purposes. But when we are doing the actual cracking step, that is the last step of this whole procedure, I'll be running it on a file that I had generated at home, as I just said, because I have permissions to do whatever I want with my own Wi-Fi and passwords. OK, so for this example, I'm going to pick this Wi-Fi that is called EduTracker Wi-Fi and it's running on channel number six. So what we want to pick from here is the BSS ID and the channel number. We need to remember these two things. First, the BSS ID and second, the channel number. Now, what you want to do after that is open up a new window on your terminal and log in as root. Now, what we want to do here is run a separate error dump scan on this specific BSS ID and check for all the devices that are actually connected to this access point. Now, we do this by running the command error dump ng. And while we are doing this, we also want to capture all the scan outputs that we actually get into a certain file. So we'll be actually storing it in a file called capture. And then we just have to pass in the BSS ID and the interface. We also have to specify the channel. So let's see what the channel is one. So the channel is channel six. So that's what we want to do. And we specify the channel with the hyphen C flags. So after you have identified the MAC address, all you need to do is copy it down and place it with after the BSS ID flag. OK, so we're going to run our command out here and we just want to say our file is going to be called well test out capture. Now that our scan is up and running, all we want to do is wait till someone is actually connected to this access point. So I forgot to mention this for this process to actually work properly. Somebody needs to be connected to that access point because what we are going to try and do is disconnect that certain device and let them reconnect and capture that log file. OK, so it seems like nobody is actually connecting to it. So at this time, all I'm going to do is go back to our error dump scan that we had run on our network interface and look for some other MAC address or other access point to actually penetrate into. And let's see if something has actually connected to that. OK, so oh, voila. Now what you see out here is that somebody has actually connected to this access point and his MAC address can be seen under the stations tab. Now what we want to do is run a deauthentication broadcast message on that station and deauthenticate that guy. Now to actually run the deauthentication process, all you have to do is go ahead and open up a new terminal window again and let the scan be running in the background. Don't close any scan at this moment. 
Okay, so the information that we need to remember is the BSS ID or rather the MAC ID of the station. Now you also want your monitoring to be running on the same channel so that your deauthentication message is being already broadcast on the same channel. So we can do that easily by going airmon ng and saying wl1 and you can say start on the specified channel. So what we want to be doing is running this on channel 6. Then we want to go and use the third suit of tools that is air replay. Now air replay is used for broadcasting the authentication messages and all sorts of stuff. Now you can see all this in the help menu also and you can do that by typing in dash dash help. If you go down you see that you can send a deauthentication message using the hyphen zero flag and that's exactly what we're going to do. Then we say zero again because we want to constantly send a broadcast of deauthentication so it's looping basically and until and unless we stop the scan nobody will actually be able to access the Wi-Fi. So it's basically like a small DOS attack. And then we want to specify the BSS ID. Okay, so it seems like I forgot the whole A tag before the BSS ID, and that should get it working. Okay, so it seems like I have copied some wrong BSS ID, I guess. So let me just go ahead and copy that once properly. Okay, so now that we have the proper BSS ID, as you guys can see, we are running a deauthentication broadcast message on that particular network access card. And now you want to run this for around a couple of minutes so that you become sure that all the devices have disconnected. Now, while this is happening, what you're doing is basically sending a DOS attack to that small little Wi-Fi. And you want to catch the handshake that occurs between devices and the router that it is connected to while reconnecting themselves. Okay, so now that we've let scan run for a couple of minutes, let us just stop it. Let's stop this other scan too. Now, if I go and list out the files on my desktop, you should see that there's something called the test capture. Now, the test capture is given to us in various formats. We have the capture format, which is test capture hyphen zero one dot cap, and then we have test capture CSV. We have a Kismet CSV. So it gives you a bunch of formats to actually run your cracking on. Now, if you remember, I had told you all that I have already generated a similar file at home, basically, when I was trying to crack into my own home password. So I will be running the test on that file or the cracking procedure on that file. And that is the last step of this whole procedure. So let me just go ahead and move into that folder. So I go CD scan. Now, as you guys can see out here, if I list down the files, you can see a capture1.cap, capture1.csv, there's a Kismet CSV, and there's a net XML. So I was not lying when I said that I have already done this at home. So we are going to run our cracking process on capture01.cap. Now, let me just tell you guys, the password for my home Wi-Fi is sweetship346. So you can say that I know the entire password, but I'm going to act like somebody who only has a general idea of what my password looks like. So let's say I know that my password contains sweet chip, but I don't really know the last three numbers or letters or whatever they may be. Okay, so we are going to use crunch once again to generate a list of words that might include sweet chip 346. And let me just open the crunch manual for once. Now, if you go down in the crunch manual, what you'll see is a hyphen T. So as you guys can see, there is a pattern that is specified like add the rate, add the rate God, and then followed by four other ad rates and all the ad rates will be replaced by a lowercase character. Now you can remove ad rate and use a comma and it'll be replaced with an uppercase character or you can use percentages which in case it'll be numbers or you could use the caret sign in which case it'll insert symbol. So when you know the length of the password and also a certain degree a few letters you can use the hyphen T flag. So that is exactly what we're going to use with crunch out here for this example. So let me just remind you guys that the password for my home Wi-Fi is sweetship346. Now what we can do is we can ask Crunch to actually generate something that looks like sweetship346. So what I could do is say Crunch. So the minimum length is 12. I already know that. And the maximum length is also 12. Now let me just input in the pattern. So we put in the pattern after hyphen T. So now I'm going to just show you how long it can take. So we are just going to say sweet and then put in some other rates. 
and then also get, try and guess in the numbers. So after you put in the pattern, you want to also input which letters and numbers they could be. And I'm just going to input my entire keyboard out here. Now, what you want to do is pipe this command through aircrack ng's cracking procedure. Okay, so now what we want to do is pipe this command through aircrack ng and we want to write from or rather read from the capture file. So what we go is hyphen w and then hyphen and then the capture file name. So capture01.cap. And then we also have to specify the ESS ID, which is given to the E flag. And the ESS ID for my home Wi-Fi is nestaway underscore C105. So that's exactly what I'm going to type in. And this will start up the cracking process on my Wi-Fi from the captured file. So as you guys can see, this is going to take a long, 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 long time. And I'm not really actually going to complete it. So in this time, I'm actually just going to try and explain why this is not very feasible on a virtual network. So basically, this is not feasible because at this moment, my computer is using all four of its cores and all the memory that is possible. So what this means is on a virtual box, this is not really possible. Your virtual box doesn't really have that much power. If you are using a four core processor computer, only two of its maximum cores can be actually allotted to your virtual box machine. Above that, you can't really give it the entire memory because that will make your computer crash. So if you want to do something like this, you, it's better that you install Kali Linux as a dual boot or as your own daily driver, and then you can do this. So this is why I have not done this on a virtual machine and instead done this on Deepin Linux, which is my daily driver operating system. Now, as you guys can see, it is constantly trying to actually guess the password by actually going through all the permutations and combinations. That is basically, it's taking in all the words generated from crunch, piping it into the current command, that is the aircraft ng command, and it's comparing everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to end this because this will take a very, very, very long time. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually try and shorten the command of the or the amount of guessing that we're trying to do so let me just try and do that so as you guys can see out here i have reduced the number of alphabets that might be actually tested but even in this case this will take a humongous amount of time and let me just show that to you so as you guys can see the test is running 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 and running and there's not really much you can do you can just let this run go out for a cup of coffee and then come back and you might still see that running. It really depends on what the password is and how much time it takes to crack it. And how much processing power you have directly affects how much time this will take. So let me just show you guys that this is taking a bunch of time. Okay, so now that I have fast forwarded a lot into the scan, you can see that I have tried almost 2127608 keys. So that's more than a million keys. That's 2 million keys that I've tried. So, and it still hasn't reached switch up 346. So what we're going to do is just to show you for demonstration purposes that this procedure actually works. Let me just shorten our guessing even more. So what we want to do is this time we want to just guess the numbers. So we will modify our command accordingly. So we just Put in sweet chip and let the algorithm just guess the 346 part. So we're going to remove the alphabets from the guessing scope also. And as you guys can see, the password is almost immediately guessed because it, only 456 keys were tested. And uh, as you guys can see, it shows that the key was found in it's sweet chip 346. Now, let me also show you that it works with the guessing of letters just because I don't think I've justified that letters are also guessed and not just numbers. So let me make it just guess the P part. That is sweet she and then it should guess P and then 346. So let me just show you that. And as you guys can see, it guesses it almost immediately after just going through 15,000 keys. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this Wi-Fi cracking tutorial and also to the end of this video, which was regarding ethical hacking using Kali Linux. I hope you guys had a bunch of fun learning about Mac changes, proxy chains, and a bunch of stuff that we did like Wi-Fi password cracking. I hope you practice these procedures and methodologies that I've taught you only for your own educational purposes and not use it to harm anybody 
or do anything harmful with it because let me just tell you very seriously that you can be prosecuted by the law so let's end this video on a good note by saying please practice this for only educational purposes i'll meet you guys in the next video about ethical hacking until then goodbye